All right, good to be here this morning. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bible, Jeremiah chapter 9, if you would please. Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. This is our memory work uh, for the month of June. And uh, kind of getting away from speaking on the family today, I had uh, uh, was still a couple of more lessons. I was trying to get it all in between uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day and uh, didn't get it done. Uh, we're going to be dealing more with correction of children and, and, and uh, the relationship there and in the next couple of weeks, but uh, I wanted to uh, uh, been taking one Sunday morning or Sunday night and uh, January, February, March, April, May, and now June and dealing with our scripture work uh, that we've been working on memorizing. I've uh, taken some scriptures that we've memorized and uh, added to our vocabulary the, the uh, way that we can actually pray these things back to the Lord and get help from Him and guidance from Him. And uh, so that's what this morning is. We're going to go back to Jeremiah uh, chapter number 9, if you would please. And uh, uh, I hope that you're working on memorizing these verses as I have done some uh, research, some studies and such. Uh, a lot of different uh, preachers, uh, evangelists and such, uh, they, they pull these verses out and they say these are tremendous verses. Uh, for believers to memorize. And I agree with that. That's why we provide it for you here. And uh, so, Jeremiah chapter number 9, verse 23 and verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise men glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Father, again, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. It would be vain for me to come here this morning and to open up the Scripture and not ask that the Holy Spirit of God would work this morning in my life in the life of these your people in the life of those who are unbelievers we know it's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings conviction into the lives of people and so father this morning we look at your word and many have applied this to our hearts of memories our Lord help us father this morning to be able to see some light upon it that we can apply to our lives in these scriptures that they would help us as individuals help us as family that it would help us as a church in our relationship one with another in our relationship with you and so father we ask your god that you would help us to be willing to confess and forsake sin and to be clean and be a vessel meet for the master's use this morning we love you and we thank you for your love for us we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is very interesting here as Jeremiah being used of the Lord to, uh, as a prophet to say these words to Israel at this time uh, because the ninth chapter is, is about a people that have rejected God. They are rejecting Him as to who He is, that He is God. They have rejected His Word. Uh, they have rejected His sovereignty. They, they have turned from God, and that's why God raised up Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, uh, to preach to them and to proclaim the Word of God to them so that Israel, God's people, would return and be in a right relationship with Him. And this is what we learn in our New Testament time, in our time right now. God wants us to be in a right relationship with Him. He wants us to be in fellowship with Him. He wants us to walk with Him. He wants us to talk with Him. He wants to enjoy our lives together with Him. And so, as we see here, Jeremiah is reaching out to the people of God. This ninth chapter, in verses number 1 through 8, we see that there is an assembly of very treacherous men. Uh, that 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 our Jeremiah is beholding here. And what's interesting is the the den of dragons that are there in verses nine through sixteen, and then the the voice of wailing that takes place in verse uh, uh, seventeen through twenty two, and then the glory of knowing the Lord. I mean, he really puts 
the situation out there. That's the kind of Bible preacher that we need. Amen? One that will be honest with us. One that will be forthright with us and tell us where we're at so we know that if we're not right with God, we can get there. Amen? Amen. If we're off a little kilter, then we can get there. Isn't it interesting when you spin a top, that top will spin and spin, and as it slowly uh, uh, dies down the momentum and stuff, it begins to wobble, and pretty soon it's wobbling and wobbling, and then it just falls over. Uh, you know, as God's people, we need to always be spinning. Amen? And we get that new spin when we spend time with Him. And that's what God wants us to do, is be able to know Him. And here is a very treacherous time for Israel. As I mentioned, there was voices of wailing out and complaining and coming before God. And so Jeremiah brings it up to him, and he says, Thus saith the Lord. This is what God has to say. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise men glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. I mean, he is coming to them and he say, you look at these perspectives that are out there, and he say, you know what? A lot of people are glorying in this. And we have that today. We have people that build up the academia of this world. And the wisdom of this world is so well promoted and so well publicized that out there. But we have to understand, it is the wisdom of the world. Now, there's a lot of adults that are here. But let me ask you about the... I almost said it. Let me ask you about creation. Most people think creation is real. And we do. But what about evolution? What do people think about evolution? Well, they, you can have both evolution and creation. I know that there is a thought out there. It's called theistic evolution, but it's really off as well. But when you think of evolution, what was it that you learned it as at, in a school? And when you were in school, what did evolution, how was it taught as a theory? A theory. It was a theory. And your teachers, I remember a ninth grade physical science and our teacher there teaching it as a theory. And there was nobody there. There was no way that we could know it. Uh, science is not there. It could not prove it and everything because nobody was there. It is a theory. But today, do you ever hear anybody mention the theory of evolution? No. They don't mention it. They just say evolution. Now, we believe in creation. We believe that there is a creator and that there is a creator God who created everything. And so here we have the wisdom of the world that's saying that out of nothing became something and that everything we have came out of nowhere and came out of nothing. When it's a lot more easier by faith to believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Because you get to think about that. Well, you know, we're billions and millions and billions of years old. Well, where, where did we come from? Well, there was a big bang. Where did the big bang come from? Well, there was these... Where did they come from? I mean, where did they think? When it's a lot easier to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so when we're talking about worldly wisdom, we're talking about a wisdom that is based upon evolution today and that man is an animal and not a created being in the image and in the likeness of God. That's where a lot of the world's wisdom comes from today. And notice if you would, hold your hand here, but go with me back to 1 Corinthians where Brother Sam read for us this morning. And congregation read, I should say. Brother Sam led us and appreciate that. But go back here and notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, notice way back, if you would please, in verse number 23, he says, But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Those that have received that calling, those that have answered that calling, those who have experienced the new birth, those that have been born again, born of the Spirit of God, He is saying very simply that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now notice what He says in verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. 
The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Let me tell you something. The worldly wisdom that is out there, when you really begin to try to make it all work and everything, it's just foolishness. It really is. It just doesn't make proper sense. It doesn't pass the, the sense smell of, of being able to know what that is. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the uh, things which are mighty. The base things of the world, the things that are spiced, hath God chosen. Yea, things which are not to bring up to naught the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in His presence. Now, he makes it very plain here that not many are called of that that are there. Now, Thank the Lord, I read one illustration of Lady Harrington of, of England. It was during the time of, of the Wesley brothers there in England, and General Booth with the Salvation Army and such. And Lady Harrington, she, she was a, 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 note, a notable person, and she spent her time, she spent her treasure, she spent her energy for the cause of Christ. And she was very high, well-to-do. And she, is saying, and she would tell people, I am saved by the M. And they'd look at her and say, saved by the M? She said, yes. Because the Bible says not many wise, not many noble. Didn't say not any noble, not any wise, <laughs> not any strong. He said not many so let me tell you something. You might have wisdom. You might have finances. You might have strength. And God is still there. Thank God He didn't say any. And He said many. Amen? And so we look here we see that, that the reason for this is that no flesh should glory in the Lord. No flesh should glory in His presence rather. We, we understand that these things are here. Now, we have... What we should, uh, uh, what some people glory in, that we should not glory in. We look at the glory of worldly wisdom, worldly wisdom in the area of finances. Uh, you know, people say we have money to make money, but people get so much in debt. I, I have always known and always learned and try to practice. Interest is good if it's an investment. It's bad if it's a loan, especially if you got credit cards. Credit cards, 19%, 18%, 24% interest. And interest is good if you've got an investment. And of course, our day and age, the investment, there's not a lot of interest coming back on that. But I'd much rather have my money making interest instead of me paying interest. But the worldly wisdom is, and you're bombarded with it all the time through television, through the internet, through the newspaper. You own a house, borrow against that, and you can enjoy life. You can travel. You can do this, that, and the other. And they try to get you and I to go deeper and deeper in debt. But we need to understand that is a worldly wisdom. That's not a wisdom from God. We look around. We see all the wise that are here. We see the atheists. We see the agnostic. We see the scientists uh, that, that brings about all the things of the world. And, and people just follow them and they think that they're so wise and they're so knowing. What is really strange to me is how people follow movie stars and celebrities. So here, here's a movie star, and uh, he is going to play a position as a detective. And so he does his research. He does his study, and he knows what it is to be a detective. And so he plays the part as a detective, and now he's an expert in that. So people go to him because he's made some studies in it. Somebody might be a scientist in a movie. And so because they've studied something, they go to them. Uh, it might be some celebrity in a talk show or Oprah or something like that. And they've got so much wisdom. But let me tell you something. A wisdom that does not have God in it is a worldly wisdom and is not of God. And so where we're in in our mess in North America, whether it's the United States or whether it's in Canada, it's because the world has gone after a worldly wisdom instead of the wisdom of God. Now notice what he says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his
is might. Now we know what might is. Might make right. There's the military might. There's the personal might. That's where a lot of times you get bullies in. They begin because they've got a little bit of uh, a bronze that they become a bully. Uh, that they begin to pick on the, the weaker ones. And he says that just because you have might, you're not to glory in that might. You're not to think that you're so lifted up in that. And then the riches of this world. The worldly riches that are there. The Bible says, What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If an individual got everything this world could offer, and yet he himself dies in his sin, and without God, he's not gaining anything. Matter of fact, he's lost. If you look with me back at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse number 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse number 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which men's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, that is so important to understand that the natural man, the unsaved man, is not going to understand the spiritual things of God. Your unsaved families, they don't understand why you go to church. They don't understand why you've given to the Lord's work. They don't understand why you would pray as a family, why you would have a meal and have prayer time. They don't understand that as a family you would sit down and read the Bible together. They don't understand how that you would live your Christian life and pray and trust God and believe God for God to do some things in your heart, God to do some things in your life. The unsaved, many times they, they look at that and they begin to wonder, how is that? That's kind of foolish in such. Because they're the natural individual. They do not know God. But as we saw in chapter 1, we see that it's the preaching of Christ under the Jew, a stumbling block, under the Greek, foolishness. But under them which are called both Jews and Greek, the power of Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Oh, let me tell you something. We look around and here and we can see those of this world and those who are trying to, to, to use the world wisdom, to try to use the world might, to try to use the world riches. Matter of fact, to be success in this world, you've got to have brains. Man, if you've got a PhD or a DD or a whatever you want to call it, if you've got all these letters after your name and you're educated, then you are successful as far as the world is concerned. I mean, you might have all that BMA and ABA and, and M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. Uh, you, you might have all of that after your name, and the world considers you successful. You might have the brains, or you might have the bronze. You know? Man, I got, man, I got muscles in places where a lot of people don't even have those places, you know? And they got all the muscles, all the bronze that is there. Man, they play football, and boy, those football players, the basketball players, they can shoot that little basket, that little the hockey players that are out there, the lacrosse players. Boy, they've got all the, the, the bronze that's there. And, and because of that, they are successful. People look at people and say, man, they've got brains. They've got, they're, they're successful. they got bronze. They're successful. And then they got bucks. Brains, bronze, and bucks. That's what the Bible says right here, doesn't it say? The wise man, the mighty man, the rich man. And people look at you and they say, man, you've got money, you must be successful. Do you realize that success in this world is not success with God? Do you realize that in the last couple of years there's been a lot of celebrities that have had lots of money, lots of education, and some bronze and some not, but some, you know, they've been in positions and they committed suicide because they were lonely, because they were depressed, because they expected something out of life that they did not get. I want you to know, outside of Christ, this life will disappoint you. Outside of Christ, this life will disappoint you. That's why God loves us so much. That He died for us that we might know Him and the power of His resurrection and the life that He has for us. In verse number 23, we see the negative 
as he said, let not the wise men glory in their wisdom, neither the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him, notice what it says, but let him that glorieth, glorieth in this. Now what does it mean to let him that glorieth? To glory is to boast and to be proud of. Now, there is a pride that overtakes oneself. And we can become a very proudful people. But what God is talking about here is understanding what God is doing in our life and what God has done for us. And that we are to be thankful. And in our thankfulness for what God has done, we can boast in the Lord. Amen? We can be proud of the things that God has done. That's why we sing, To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. And so when you look at your life, and you, I look at my life, and realize what God has done, this is what we're to glory in. He said, Let him that glory, glory in this, that he understands and knoweth me. There's the first thing right there. You have to understand and know God. Do you understand and know the Lord? There are those that glory in those things of brains and bronze and bucks, but we should glory in the Lord. We should glory in what God has done for us. First of all, in salvation. The fact that I was a sinner and on my way to a devil's hell and God loved me and gave Christ for me that Christ died for my sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried and that He arose again he took my sin and there He died on the cross and He was buried and He rose again. Died on the cross. He shed His blood that cleanses us from all sins. What a blessing that is. What a glory that is. Let me tell you something. We need to know God. We are to glory in our salvation. When you have an opportunity to give a testimony of your salvation, you need to step right up and say, Man, I was saved September 15, 1963. I was just a 10-year-old boy. I had gone to church three Sundays in a row, and the preacher preached, and God spoke to my heart, and I realized that I was a sinner. I came and asked Christ to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and be my personal Savior, and God saved me that day. All of it takes, I never get tired of telling my testimony of what Jesus Christ did for a little 10-year-old boy. That day, the Holy Spirit of God was dealing with me. He was dealing with me. And I realized that I needed Jesus as my Savior. And I am so thankful that my life was changed because of Him. And do you know Him? And you ought to glory in this and say, praise God for the testimony of what Jesus Christ has done for me. We need to, this little light of mine, we need to let it shine. We need to be bold in our witness for Christ. First, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. John, chapter 17. Of course, we know this as the intercessory prayer of our Lord. And this priestly prayer, this is the true Lord's prayer, not the model prayer. But in John 17, in verse number 1, these words spake Jesus, lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. And he's getting ready to go to the cross. So now he's praying. Verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give life, eternal life, to as many as thou hast given him. Notice verse 3. And this is life eternal that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. This is what eternal life is all about. Eternal life is that you and I might know God. Why did God create man to begin with? So that man could fellowship with God. God made Adam and He made Eve so that they could have fellowship one with another of Adam's free will and volition. But because of Adam's sin, we're all sinners. And the eternal life that's given to us is that we can know God. Do you know God? Do you? I'm not just talking about in your head, have some idea of what God, but do you know Him experimentally? By experimentally, I mean do you know Him and the knowledge of Him? He will bless you when you get to truly know Him and that you may know only true God and Jesus Christ who thou hast sinned. 
Notice he says, Let him that glory glory that he understandeth and knoweth me. To know God in a real way blesses you as an individual. You as an individual can truly be blessed of God if you know Him as your Savior. Him and Him alone will give you eternal life. But not only that, He will be with you at this time. If you know God and understand who God is, He is a blessing to your family. You don't want to hold God, withhold God from your family. You want your family to know God. You want your family to know Him who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Him who forgives sins. Him who gives life. Life everlasting. He said, I am come that you might have an abundant life. Not just life, but the abundant life. It should be for our family. We are to know God as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to experience God doing a work in our midst in healing individuals, in strengthening brothers and sisters in Christ, and making sure that God is able to put forth His gospel. A nation that would know God and know who God is, God would bless that nation. But the Bible says many nations have forgotten God, and that's why He turns them to hell. Oh, let me tell you something. We must not forget God as a nation. We must not forget God as a people. We must not forget God as a church. We must not forget God as a family and as an individual. We must not forget God. You say, can churches forget God? Yes, sir. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him and sup with him and be with me. You know what he's talking about there? He's not talking about knocking on your heart's door. He's talking about knocking on the church's door. He's outside of the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea said, We have need of nothing. The churches of today, many of them say, we have need of nothing. Why? Because they got the wisdom. They got the power. And they've got the, the, the money. I mean, Peter and them had it right when they so, saw the man beside the gate beautiful. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And the man rose and walked. But you know what churches today say? Oh, we've got silver, we've got gold. Oh, let me tell you, Jesus Christ is on the outside of many churches today. Jesus Christ is on the outside of many families. Jesus Christ is on the outside of believers saying, I want back into your heart. I want to take control of your life. I want to be a blessing to you. I want to guide and direct. The understanding is, it is to have an intelligence as to who God is and how He works. To know Him and to understand Him. Knowing is, is that which is very practical and walking in His way. How is it that we have this experiment? We walk with God. We walk in His way. We find out which way God is going and we go with Him. Many times we say to God, Hey God, come go with me. Come go with me. Have you ever stopped to think, Lord, I want to go with you today? And you know, it's interesting. God's still going to walk to your work and have you work. God's still going to have you at your home. God's still going to have you at your place of service. God's still going to have you. He just wants to walk with you. And to know Him and to know His presence and to understand this. And He says very simply, let Him that glory, glory this, that He understandeth and knoweth Me. And He knows, and notice what He says, that I am the Lord. Who is He? He's the great I Am. That's why Jesus said, I am that I am. That's why the uh, Old Testament there in the book of Exodus, He said, who shall we say sent us? I am, I am. He is the great I am. And He said very simply here, I am the Lord. And that's who He is. We get to know the Lord. You know, so what if you get to know some great celebrity? You get to know some great politician. You, you get to know somebody that, 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 that is somebody. I had a friend that, that worked a little bit on, on Ronald Reagan's ranch in Southern California. And he got to meet Ronald Reagan, who was once a president, and I say, once an actor. And man, you know, man, you know what? I get to know Jesus. <laughs> Top that. Huh? Who, 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 who else can you get above Jesus? 
We get to know Him. We get to read His Word. We get to pray to Him. We get to have an experiment with Him and spend time with Him. And notice, here we can walk with Him. And walking with Him, listen, if we glory in this, that we know Him and we understand Him, that we're walking in His way, and that He is the Lord that exercised. Now, you know what exercise is? It's doing something. My exercise. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. And every hunter has that as an exercise, right? You got to pull that trigger when it comes time. And uh, but you know, you, you've got the exercise that you do. It's actually doing something. It is putting forth an effort. And notice what he says: "I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness. Loving kindness. When you know God, you know that He loves you, and His loving kindness is given towards you. I'm here to tell you." God loves you. Just as out of all the popularity of people in this world, we get to know Him, He gets to know you. Just as I individually can know God who is the Creator of all, who takes care of all, who knows every hair on every head in this room and in the entire world, He knows that when a sparrow falls to the ground, that God I get to know. But that same God knows you. And loves you. And exercising towards you that loving kindness. Now the word loving kindness is used 248 times in the Old Testament alone. It is that mercy, God's mercy that He demonstrates for them. Let me tell you something. If I got what I deserve, I... I would be in a terrible mess, but because of His mercy, God withholds that. Because of His grace, He gives me something that I do not deserve. Oh, let me tell you something. He exercised loving kindness to you. Do you realize that every day that you get up? Oh, I know. I know you might have that ingrown toenail. I know you might have that crick neck and I know the arthritis might be there. I know the headaches might be there. I know things might happen, but I want us to realize that even with all of this, God still loves you. He loves you very, very much. Even if you're looking at financial areas, you're looking at physical things, you're looking at the flesh, you're looking at things... God still loves you. Why do these things happen if, if God still loves us and cares for us? Because God wants Him, or wants us, you and I, to be dependent upon Him. To come to Him. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You come to God with a physical problem, He won't cast you out. God will be with you. He'll give you the grace to be able to go through that. God's grace is sufficient. You, you feel sorry for yourself with your aches and pains, and we all have them, it seems like. Don't read Paul's story. 2 Corinthians. You read what happened to the Apostle Paul. The time that he was stoned to death. The time that he was beaten. The time that he was shipwrecked. Uh, the time that he was under this and under that. And he said, you know what? God's grace. He, he prayed for the thorn of the flesh to be removed from it. But God says, my grace is sufficient for you. You know why God gives us that grace? is because He is loving God. He loves us. And he, he, he said that we are to glory in the loving kindness of God. He not only exercised loving kindness, but He exercises judgment. That judgment that is given. You see, God is a justifier. God is the one who is able to give true justice and true belief. Look with me in Jeremiah chapter number 2, if you would please. I'm sorry. Jeremiah chapter 4. And verse 2. A little display. Jeremiah chapter 4. Well, let's begin in verse 1. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thy abominations out of thy sight, thou, then shalt thou not remove. Thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nation shall bless themselves in him. And in Him shall they glory. Now, apply this Scripture to you as an individual. Apply this Scripture to you as a family. The Lord liveth in truth, 
in right and judgment and in righteousness, and the families and the individuals shall be blessed in him, and in him shall they glory. As a family, as an individual, as a church, we need to say, Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And exercise that. He is a God of judgment. He is able to, to deal with that justly. And the God of this world will always do right. He will always do right. But not only that, He's God of righteousness. As speaking of doing right, he is, a, he is loving kindness to the believer, to the godly. He deals judgment with the ungodly, and He will deal with them, each and every one. But with the righteous, He will do right, and He is the faithful one that is able to help us. I am the Lord which exercised loving kindness. I am the Lord that exercised judgment. I am the Lord that exercised righteousness. When does He exercise it? Right now, because in the earth. That is a present time. This is where we're at. We're on the earth. We're in the earth. Positionally, praise God, for those who understand the position in Christ, we're already in heaven. As we've been there 24 hours. The day we got saved, positionally, we are in Christ. But practically and understandably, we are in this world. And He says very simply that I am the Lord that exercises loving kindness. I am the Lord that exercises judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. Now, remember we talked about knowing God experimentally. Knowing God is knowing what He delights in. What would it be for you and I to know God is to delight in those things as well. Hey husbands, you want to score points with your wife? Find out what she delights in in uniform. Be there with her. Put it in. Uh, wives, find out what delights your husband. And get that. And be there. And understand that. And let me tell you something. The honey will flow and the honeymoon won't be over. It will keep going on and on and on and on and on and on. When you delight in what your spouse is delight. And parents, find out what your kids like and delight in that as well. And kids, find out what your parents like and delight in that as well because there is a principle that is here. He says, "In these, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. When there is a delightfulness in these things and understanding as to who God is, that you and I can have a part in the delightfulness of Jesus Christ and our Savior. Now I want you to look with me in chapter 10 at just two verses. Chapter 10 and verse number 6. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. I want us to realize that knowing God is to know who He really is. Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. When we understand to know that God's name is great and mighty and powerful, but with His name comes His character. With His character comes the image of God. When we understand the name of God, we understand the image of God and the character of God. Now do you understand what when we're talking about as the character of God is? Remember the old typewriters? Remember, I, young people have no idea about the old typewriters today. But that, that lever would go and hit that ribbon and it would push the ink onto the paper and that would make a what? A character. It would make a letter, uh, an abbreviation, I mean a, 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 a semicolon, a number or something, of that symbol of something. It would make a character. On, it would make an impression upon that. I want to know what kind of character it impression that God made upon you. Has God made such an impression upon you that you, you're going to say, I'm going to glory in the Lord. I see what God's done in my life. And I don't deserve any of it. But to God be the glory. And give Him the praise, the honor, the majesty that He deserves. One last scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 
Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. You know what? Of ourselves, we cannot go through ourselves. But what we can say is, great things God has done for us. But I want to close this morning with what we call the sufficiency of Christ. The sufficiency of Christ. Because we are lost sinners, condemned before God already. But notice if you would, verse 30. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who God hath made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. I want us to realize that in Christ Jesus is the wisdom and the righteousness and the sanctification and the redemption that is in Him. Let me tell you something. I'm going into God's heaven we're the abode of God Almighty. But I'm not getting there because I'm a preacher. I'm not getting there because I pray. I'm not getting there because I read my Bible. I'm not getting there because I'm such a nice guy and treat all you people so nice and so well and everything. I'm not going to get there by any other means other than by the blood and the grace of God Almighty. Because Jesus Christ is my wisdom my righteousness, my sanctification, my redemption. He made a way for me. And as I said very hurriedly earlier, that as a 10-year-old boy, I asked Christ to forgive me of my sins, come into my heart and be my personal sin. Have you trusted Him? Do you know Him in a real understanding way? Do you know His loving kindness? <laughs> His righteousness to us. His judgment to us. That He is a God that will always do right. Because He loves you and He cares for you. And He's made a way of salvation for each and every one. And we'll just come to Him. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love You. And we thank You so much for Your love for us. Lord, these verses are so real. that we as Your children can read and understand and know You. That our Christianity is real. It's not just a put on on Sunday morning, but it's something that is through our life every day. On Monday and Tuesday, our children, our spouses, our employers, our employees, people that were around, they know that You're real to us and that we glory in You. We don't need to let the petty things of this life bother us. The wisdom of this world, the, the mightiness of this world, the, 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 the riches of this world to rob us of the blessing of knowing You and living for You. Oh, sweet Jesus, speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, as Jeremiah brought this to a people that were rejecting You, Father, may this message today help us to receive the work of God, Christ as our Savior, and the company of the Holy Spirit. Father, don't let sin enter our relationship with You. We ask this in Christ's name. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm asking Swan to come to the piano and play a verse or two of invitation. If God spoke into your heart this morning. I trust that He has. I trust that God has reached through His Holy Spirit beyond the words of this pastor. That He has spoken to your heart and showed you your need. That you would pray to God. That you would reach out and know Him. Know He loves you. Know that the judgment that He deals with you is the right justice to help you to be in that relationship with Him. And that God will do a mighty work in your heart. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know for sure that when you die that you go to heaven, please let us take time from the Scripture to share with you the Word of God. 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. As the pianist begins to play, if God spoke to your heart, why don't you come?